Good morning, good morning, Rock Church. How we doing? I hope everyone had a good 4th of July and saw some fireworks, hopefully. We are so thankful to worship Jesus this morning in the house of the Lord. Who's excited? Let's go. I need, who's excited to worship Jesus this morning? Okay, if you're, go, if you're in the lobby, go ahead and join us in the, the sanctuary. If you're not yet standing, go ahead and stand with us. This morning as I was spending time with the Lord, he just put Psalm 28, 6 through 7. And the thing that I was feeling this morning is whatever you bring this morning, Jesus wants to be our help. Whether you're stressed or whether you're excited, whether you have a lot going on or you have nothing really going on, it says, praise the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and shield. I trust him with all of my heart. He helps me and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out in song of thanksgiving. And so this morning, Jesus wants to be your help. He's our ever help in a time of need. And this morning, our response to his help needs to be this. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. So this morning, whatever you've come into the sanctuary with, whatever you've come in to the house of the Lord with, the Lord wants to, to respond to you as we respond to him with thanksgiving. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna jump into worship right after I pray. But whatever you've come in, just lay it at his feet and let him help you this morning. Jesus, we say that we love you and we're so grateful to join this morning with the angels in heaven as they say, holy, holy, holy. God, we love to come in to worship you in spirit and in truth. So this morning, God, I'm asking that our hearts would align with the truth of your word, that you are our help and we get to respond with a burst of song and thanksgiving. So this morning we wanna do that, Jesus. We love you and it's in your name we pray, amen. i mm -hmm. 
continue on in worship in just a moment, but right now we're going to receive communion together as a church family. You can grab the elements that you received on the way in. If you need the communion elements, can you raise your hands? Ushers, if you can just kind of look around and get these ones, those elements. As they do that, I'm going to explain the significance of what we're about to do again to prepare our hearts to receive the body and blood of Jesus in communion. See, the night before he was crucified, he was having this Passover supper this Passover meal with his disciples that we call the Last Supper. The night before he was crucified and he took bread, broke it, passed it around, said, this is my body broken for you. He took the cup of wine, poured it out, passed it around, said, this is my blood of my new covenant that I'm about to establish with you. And he says, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In communion, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. See, there's power in remembering what he's done for us, amen? We get so distracted by our lives and all the distractions that come with it that it's so easy to look at our lives through an earthly lens, through a fleshly lens rather than the lens of the gospel. But in communion, we return to that vision of Jesus and his love and his passion and his sacrifice on the cross. And suddenly we begin to see all of life through the lens of what he's done, amen? But before we receive communion this morning, like we always say, communion's about remembrance and about repentance. So we always like to leave time, just a moment in time to prepare our hearts to receive communion together. So I'm just going to, in a moment, step aside just for about 60 seconds or so, just to leave room for us to, to look to Jesus, to say, Lord, is there anything you would have me break agreement with? Is there anything from this week you would have me repent of? To confess before you, to prepare my heart for communion. I want to invite you to repent this morning of anything he brings to mind. And number two, I want to invite you to remember his love. Remember his sacrifice. Remember that he did all that he did so that you could be with him forever. Amen. So let's just leave a minute. Let's prepare our hearts. Then I'm going to come back over and we'll take communion together. prepare to take the bread bread together. You can open it. I'm going to pray for us and then we'll take it together. Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken on that cross. Thank you that by your stripes we are healed. By your stripes we are redeemed. There's a new and living way, Hebrews says, through the veil of your flesh. 
the new and living way to the Father. Thank you that the only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ. You're the way, the truth, and the life when we receive of that bread this morning. Let's take of that together. Once you've done that, let's prepare to take of the, the cup together. Jesus, we remember your blood that was poured out. We remember your sacrifice. We thank you that your blood that was poured out cleanses us as white as snow, cleanses us from our past, cleanses us from our sins. But number two, it also establishes a covenant with God. We can have relationship with God forever. We thank you for your blood that you poured out for us on the cross. Let's partake of that together. Once you've done that, you can stand and lift your hands with me as we go back into worship. Jesus, we just say thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your death, but thank you for your resurrection. Thank you for the victory of the cross, that our sin and the, the world and the devil have no power to dominate us anymore. They're no longer our masters, but we are free in Christ. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. Can we thank the Lord this morning? Let's worship together.
we love you. We thank you for your faithfulness this morning. Thank you that who you were is who you are and who you will forever be. You say that you are the Lord and you never change. Psalm 27, 13, I would have lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Powerful passage, Jesus. Thank you that because we have seen your goodness, we can be confident about your future goodness in our lives, your future faithfulness in our lives. Regardless of what we're going through now, I thank you that the goodness we've witnessed and the faithfulness we've witnessed in our past of answered prayer, of the intervention of God, of the faithfulness of God, it gives us confidence in the here and now. And for those in this room who have wrestled to believe your faithfulness, to have confidence that there is goodness in the days ahead, be, uh, the days ahead, because God is good. I pray that you would touch their hearts right now. In fact, if that's you, just lift your hands to the Lord. God, we need a fresh revelation of your faithfulness and your goodness and your love again. And I pray that you would give that to us this morning. Give us a fresh understanding of how good you really are. Remind us, even today, of all that you've done for us of how you've demonstrated your faithfulness time and time and time again in our lives. And let us look forward to the future with confidence that we would have lost heart unless we believed we would see the goodness of the Lord again and again and again demonstrated in our lives in the days to come. We love you, we praise you, we pray that you'd bless the rest of this service in Jesus' name and everybody said. Can we thank the Lord again this morning? Well, welcome to The Rock. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. So good to be with you. If it is your first time here, can you raise your hand? Can we welcome our first timers this morning? It's got some over there. And we have a gift that we wanna give you. So right after this service, please go on out to the lobby to the Welcome Center. We'd love to get you plugged in here at our church. Other than that, we have an amazing speaker. Pastor Mike Lucia is with us today. And so before we get to that, why don't you turn to greet one another? Good morning. Good morning. 
How's everybody doing today? You staying cool? Should, should we not even talk about it? It's too soon. Let's just, let's just, we'll just move right past it. Uh, quick mention today, Rick and Cindy are not going to be with us today, unfortunately. Uh, Cindy's stepmom passed away this last week, and so they're in Arizona taking care of family stuff. So if you could please just be keeping Rick and Cindy in your prayers, that would be much appreciated. If that wasn't enough, they both came down with COVID while they were there and have been stuck in a hotel room dealing with that, which is the worst. So we're a praying church. We believe in the power of prayer. They, they would greatly benefit from all of us praying for them. So please, please be doing that today, okay? All right, well, we're going to continue our sermon series today. We are in the Summer on the Mount, and we're also going to be continuing through the Beatitudes. And today I'm going to be looking at verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That sound good to anybody? Anybody else want to see God? I know that I do. And I think what we're talking about here is a little bit of a double portion. That we have the opportunity to see God eternally and live with Jesus in heaven for the rest of our life. But we also have an opportunity to see God here and now, today, and encounter him in our life. And I know that we all want that as well. So let's pray and we'll get moving. Lord, thank you for getting us in your house today. God, I ask that anybody that's been impacted by the extreme weather or the power outages or anything else that's going on, that you would just be with them. Lord, we lift up Rick and Cindy to you today. We pray that you would be with them, that you would comfort them, that you would help them heal, that you'd get them home safe. And God, we just ask that you would be present with all of us here today, that your Holy Spirit would move through this place. I ask that you'd bless the word and that we would walk out of here with something new, a deposit directly from you. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 All right. If you're taking notes, the title of the message today is The Road to Reward. The Road to Reward. And let's look at verse 8 one more time. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And at a high level, keep it very simple, what's this saying? This is saying that those of us that have a pure heart, there's a blessing and a reward that we can expect. It's a promise based on verse 8 that says that we will have the ability to see God. But it's important before we go too much further that we talk about the heart, because there's a lot of references all throughout Scripture of the heart. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for heart can be actually translated into mind. In the New Testament, Paul interchangeably uses heart and soul. So be thinking about that today. And the heart just generally refers to the moral center of our personality, from which flow thoughts emotions, actions, and speech, okay? So we're going to keep it there. We're going to keep it simple. There's a lot of scripture, and you can go pretty deep into that. But for, for today, we're just going to keep it there. And since it's the middle of, or I guess the beginning of July, we're in primetime vacation season. And so I tried to have a little fun with the message. We're going to have a travel theme with us today. And so I got three points wrapped around travel and taking vacations. The first one is we got to know our destination. You got to know where you're going. The second thing is, then we got to hit the road, we got to get on the road, and then the third is we got to stay on the road so we can reach our destination. Those are the three things we're going to look at today. So let's go. Number one, know your destination. Every trip that we take, any travel that we go on, starts with one thing. Starts with dropping the pin. Got to drop the pin. No one is making any flight arrangements, hotel reservations, or putting anything into the GPS without knowing a destination. Obviously, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. First, we choose the destination. Then we make the flights. Then we plug it into the GPS. Then we make the arrangements for the hotel. Same can be said for our faith. You got to know the destination. Once we choose our destination, I've chosen heaven. I've chosen my destination as Jesus. And once I choose that, everything else around me should flow from there. My thoughts, my actions, my behaviors, my morals, my relationships, the destination matters, doesn't it? But just because we know the destination, that doesn't mean that the road there is going to be easy. It's quite the opposite. 
in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches and preaches in chapter 7, verse 13, he says this, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Jesus tells us that we should choose the narrow way, but he tells us it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult. And those that have traveled, no, travel can be hard sometimes. I went on a trip recently and I had a six hour flight cross country, had to fly over multiple time zones. And I had the first flight out, so I was up early, got to the airport hour ahead of time, I was feeling pretty good, I was tired, I was feeling pretty good. Everything's on track, I get through security, I get to the gate, oh, I get the text, flight's been delayed, bummer. 20 minutes later, I get another text, flight's been delayed again, two delays. And you know, now I'm getting frustrated. It's like I could have spent an hour in my bed at home, but I'm here at the airport, still dark outside. You know, you're going through all the usual stuff. Finally board the plane, we take off. I hit the button on my seat, recline, I'm starting to relax. And the person behind me thought, now is a good time for me to do voice dictation into my phone <laughs> for five hours. Never been so thankful for Apple AirPod noise cancellation in my entire life. Made it bearable. But you know, I wonder if I was headed to Maui as my destination instead of Columbus, Ohio. If my outlook and the way that I was processing all my travel frustrations probably would have been a little bit different. Probably would have been a little bit different. Yeah, I know my flight's been delayed twice and I know that there's some annoying stuff happening around me, but you know what, who cares? I'm gonna be on the beach in a couple of hours. I can endure, I can, the destination matters. And the same could be said about our faith. Doesn't mean we're gonna go through life and we're not gonna have hardship. We're gonna experience grief and loss and disappointment and pain. But if I know that my destination, that this isn't the final destination for me and I got rewards waiting for me in heaven and I'm gonna live with Jesus face to face one day, you know what, I can probably endure. I can probably make it through some of the things that are here today. My bounce back ability becomes shorter and shorter. The destination matters, amen? It matters. Let's stay on the same point and I want you to replace the word destination for the word reward. I need to know my reward. And let me ask you this, is it okay for me to be striving for rewards? As a Christian and as a follower of Jesus, is it okay for my heart to desire reward? Is it okay that I will be motivated and inspired by rewards? Or, or is that a little too prosperity gospel-ish? Well, think about this. Should my faith and my walk with Jesus be focused on things like giving, sacrificing, praying, fasting, and serving? Or should my faith be focused on rewards and, and, and getting and taking? It's a trick question. Not really much of a trick. I think you know the answer. The answer is yes, it's both. It's both. I should be focused on both. Rewards are important. But I could also make the argument that giving and sacrificing and fasting and serving, I could tell you that is fundamental to my faith. I could also tell you that could be destructive to my faith. Mike, what do you mean? Well, it all goes back to verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Because you know what? The Pharisees were really good at sacrificing and praying and fasting, but their heart was not pure. Jesus rebuked them left and right. If we're not careful just because we're doing and I'm fasting and I'm serving and I'm giving and I'm tithing and I'm doing all those things, if my heart isn't pure and my heart isn't right, it could be destructive. It could give me a false sense of salvation. It could give me a false sense of security in what I'm doing. 
But of course they're foundational. We just got to have the right heart. And you could make the same argument with rewards, with a rewards mindset. I could tell you it's fundamental to my faith. It's also destructive to my faith if my heart about it's not pure. If my relationship with God is a quid pro quo relationship, I'm only entering into this relationship so I can get something back. I'm only tithing because I'm expecting God's going to return a monetary gain back to me. We would all agree that's not a healthy heart posture. But if a rewards mindset and my posture is, you know what, my reward is Jesus. He is my reward. I want to be in his presence. I want to encounter him. I want to see signs and wonders in my life. I want to be in his presence. And that is my reward. It motivates me. It inspires me. And I want it every single day. Is that a healthy rewards mindset? Amen. It is. It is. And in fact, Jesus teaches on rewards throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount. It spans chapters 5, 6, and 7. He teaches on rewards. The Beatitudes are all attached to rewards. It lists character, moral values, ways that we should live our life and associated rewards with each one of them. Just really quickly, just look at a few. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be rewarded with comfort. They'll be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be rewarded, I'm paraphrasing, with being content, with being filled, with being satisfied. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall be rewarded with seeing God. The Beatitudes are filled with rewards. It's biblical. Jesus teaches on it. He teaches on rewards three times in chapter 6. Three times. He teaches about giving. He teaches about praying. He teaches about fasting. And each one of them talks about being rewarded. Let's just read one of them. Matthew chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. When you do a charitable deed, it's talking about giving, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. He says the same thing for praying, that he will reward you openly. He says the same thing for fasting, that your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Jesus teaches on it. And what's amazing about this is this reward is not being passed by second. This is a reward, it says, directly from your Father in heaven. And I love that the New King James and the King James says that he will reward you openly. I love that. Because if he's rewarding me openly, it shouldn't be hard to find. That means I should be able to see it beyond a shadow of a doubt. It means I should be able to encounter it in a really strong way because he's rewarding me openly. That's amazing. Anybody else want to be rewarded openly by the Father in heaven? Yeah. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. So I got two key takeaways here on this first point of knowing our destination or knowing our rewards. Number one, rewards are biblical and being rewarded is part of our relationship with God. And these rewards are supposed to be eternal and they're also for today. And number two, God's reward system is built on verse eight. It's built on a pure heart. We got a little bonus content for point number one. A little bonus content. The reward system is biblical. It's also scientifically proven. We're going to talk about the Bible and science coexisting. It's possible. It's possible. So let's talk science for just a minute. We have a reward system built into our brain. So keep in mind, heart and mind and brain, that's what we're talking about. We have a physical reward system actually built into our brain. We have something called the limbic system. It's a physical structure, it's part of our brain. And our limbic system is responsible for regulating emotions and behavior and motivation and memory, scientifically proven. We also have a lot of neurons inside of our brain. And these neurons release a chemical called dopamine. And dopamine provides a physical sensation in our brain that says, that's good. That feels good. I should want to do more of that. I should seek out and try to find how I can do that again and again. 
our limbic system and the neurons and the dopamine all work together in our brain to create a reward system. Well, guess what? God designed our brain. He designed our limbic system. He designed dopamine. It's an amazing thing when I realize that spiritually and biblically, God says our relationship is built on my promises and rewards. It's amazing when I can look at science and I can say I'm physically built and designed to respond to a rewards relationship with my heavenly father. It's an amazing thing, is it not? So I want you to think about it this week. I want you to ask yourself in your prayer time, in your reflection time, how do rewards play a role in your faith? Do you openly embrace a rewards mindset? Is it something you shy away from because you feel like it's too prosperity? Is it something you overindulge in? What does your rewards mindset look like and how does it play a role in your faith? Spend some time on that this week. Final two points today. Now that we know our destination and we know our reward, we got to get on the road. It's time to hit the road. Then we got to stay on the road and we got to reach the actual destination. So if we need to get on the road, I want to go back to what we just talked about a minute ago. There's a problem with what I just said. If our brain has a reward system built into it and we have all these great things that our brain is, is capable of, and I know that verse eight says I need a pure heart, well, what happens with our sinful nature? What happens to the fact that we live in a broken world? Verse eight tells me I need a pure heart in order to see God. But what if my heart's not pure? Maybe you're sitting here today feeling like your heart is not pure. Well, God gives us an answer for this. We need to be saved and we need to be renewed. We need to be transformed. I know it's fundamental, but if we want to see God and we don't have a pure heart, our heart needs to be purified. Our heart needs to be cleansed. We need to be washed from the inside out so that we can see God. Romans 10, well-known verse. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The action that we take is that we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that what Jesus did on the cross and my faith in him saves me. And there's an immediate reward. We're talking rewards today. There is an immediate set of rewards that I receive at the moment of salvation. I can now stand before God and he sees a pure heart. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how long you've been lost. It doesn't matter how far you've strode straight away. It doesn't matter. He sees you with a pure heart. And I now have an identity as a child of God. My name is written in the book of life. I am forgiven and I have the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of me. The instant that you enter into salvation, you are automatically rewarded and blessed with all of those things. Anybody thankful for that today? Hey, that's good news. That's good news. So now what? My heart's been purified. I've been cleansed and washed from the inside. I'm on the road to life. I am on the narrow way. I'm on the narrow road. But Romans 12 also says this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Spiritually, I've been born again. I've been renewed. My spirit, I now have a reservation in heaven. I'm saved. Does that mean that everything that's happened in my life up to that point, trauma, memories, behaviors, habits that I've formed over the years, do they automatically go away at the moment of salvation? Look, I, I, I believe in supernatural healing. I believe in supernatural deliverance. I believe that the Lord can do a lot and I will never put him in a box, never ever. But for a lot of us, and based on this scripture, it says that my mind still needs to be renewed, still needs to be renewed. Another way of saying that is my brain needs to be rewired. I got to rewire my brain. 
So biblically, we know we need to be transformed and renewed. I got to create new thought patterns, new habits, new actions, new behaviors. I want my thought life to change. Biblically, it says that my mind can do that. I can be renewed. Guess what? Science also proves that this is true. We're doing the Bible and science today. And science says it's possible. My wife's a pediatric nurse practitioner. She worked at Children's Hospital Oakland for a number of years when we were first married. She worked in the epilepsy department. And they worked with kids that had really extreme cases of seizures and epilepsy. And they would bring them in and they would do certain things to try to figure out what was causing the seizures. In some cases, medication would help. In some cases, it wouldn't. And so they would try to pinpoint the parts of the brain that were causing the seizures. And in some cases, they would write them up to be candidates for surgery. And they would go in and actually remove parts of the brain that were causing the epilepsy. And in some cases, it really would help. In the most extreme cases, they would perform something called a hemispherectomy. They would go in and remove an entire half of the brain, an entire half of the brain. The kids would come out and they would be paralyzed on one side because the right side of my brain controls the function on the left side of my body. They'd be paralyzed on one side. But over time, their brain would rewire and retrain themselves so they would gain function back on this side of the body with only half of a brain. Amazing. If that's possible, that should give a lot of us hope. That should give us a lot of hope. Our brain's amazing. God designed it. He gave it to us. There's no no mistakes. If I can spiritually be renewed and reborn, if I can scientifically transform and rewire my brain to think differently and act differently, man, I got a lot of hope that I can reach my destination. Anybody else? Yeah. So now what? I'm on the road to life. Time to kick it into autopilot or self-drive mode. No, because Jesus said, once you're on the narrow way, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. Point number three, how do we maintain a pure heart? Been purified, been cleansed, starting to be renewed. But how do I maintain it? How do I keep a pure heart? Proverbs chapter four Verse 23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. God's purified it. Now guard it. How do you guard your heart? You guard it with guard rails, boundaries, guard rails. That's what we're talking about. While you're on the road to your destination, two things are guaranteed. Traffic and billboards, guaranteed. Just think about billboards. This helps me. What is the sole purpose and intention of a billboard? Is to get your attention and eventually get your wallet. I don't even know how they're legal. I mean, you can't text while you drive, but you can take your eye off the road and go look at these digital billboards that are flashing stuff constantly and read about things that are happening. and. They, I don't know how it's legal. There's actually four states that have outlawed them. Seems like they should all be outlawed. Is our faith and our walk on the narrow way any different? The enemy is real good at putting up billboards and littering the narrow way with all kinds of distraction and temptation to try to get you off of the narrow way back onto the broad road, which leads to destruction. I mean, think about what some of these billboards do. In two miles, exit and come to our store. In one mile, exit, come to our restaurant. They're trying to get you off of the road. And the same thing happens with our walk when we're on the narrow way. So we need guardrails so that we stay on the narrow way. I've worked too hard. It's too important. I got too much to lose. I can't get off of the narrow way. I want to stay on it. I know it's going to be hard. Therefore, I am going to protect the narrow way with boundaries and guardrails. Jesus teaches on it in the Sermon on the Mount. Let's listen to what he has to say. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 through 30. This is Jesus teaching about adultery in the heart. You have heard 
that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Happy Sunday. Such an uplifting verse for us today. <clears throat> Don't be offended. Jesus is teaching us something really important here. Are you familiar, ever heard the term addition by subtraction? Addition by subtraction. Sounds to me that's kind of what Jesus is saying. By taking something away, you're adding something. Are you really losing or are you gaining? He's making a connection between profit and loss. He says it's more profitable for you to remove something. It's more profitable for you to separate something. I think we can learn a lot from that. If you want to maintain a pure heart and see God, <clears throat> he may be calling you to remove and separate from some things in your life. We do that by implementing guardrails and boundaries. I know this isn't the fun part of the message, but it's important. We got to know it. We got to do it. We got to listen to what Jesus is trying to teach us. I get challenged on this quite a bit. Worship team, you guys can, next couple minutes, start heading out. <clears throat> I get challenged on this quite a bit. Mike, that sounds legalistic. Don't live under the law anymore and all these rules. Got grace. Don't need that. Mike, I can't just remove myself from the world and live in a bubble. I need to be strong enough to just exercise self-control. It's biblical. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Mike, in Ephesians, Paul talks about putting on the armor of God. All I need to do is just get my armor on and I can just head out there and I can just do it. I don't need guardrails or boundaries. I'll just armor up. Mike, in Philippians, Paul says, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Just got to be strong enough. I want to challenge you today to think about strength differently. Because so often we think about strength as just, just going to get out there and just going just gonna to do it just going to fight it, just, just got to be strong. And don't get me wrong, there are seasons and situations where you're going to have to fight, you're going to have to battle, you're going to be in the trenches. I believe it. But what if we measured strength in terms of wisdom and discernment instead of just brute force? What if my prayer was, God, would you strengthen my ability to discern what's happening? Would you strengthen my wisdom so that I can just make better decisions? What if we measured strength different? I encourage you to think about that a little bit. Think about it in terms of wisdom and discernment. Can you imagine if the U.S. went to war every time there was a potential for conflict? It wouldn't be feasible. We'd be in wars every single day. Part of being strong is de-escalating and avoiding conflict, that's not weak, that's smart, that's wisdom, that's discernment. Same can be said for us implementing boundaries and guardrails. Do we go to war and fight the same way that we did in the Civil War today? Where I would stand literally for me to you and we would just take turns just shooting each other, fighting with bayonets and cannonballs? We don't do that anymore, it's not effective. We gotta be smarter about the way that we fight. Modern warfare relies on intelligence capabilities. Drones, intercontinental missiles, and cyber warfare. There's a lot of scary stuff that can go wrong with that too, but you get the point. Let me be a little bit more direct, a little bit more practical. If I need to lose weight and get healthier, what makes more sense? For me to go downstairs and open up the cupboard, look at those Oreos and say, not today. Not today, not today, not today. I got my armor on, I'm ready. Or does it make more sense to just get rid of the Oreos and not buy them at the store anymore? I put myself in a situation where I know I'm gonna win.
It was my birthday recently and my wife put up balloons and one of the weights on the balloons were my favorite candies, Sour Patch Kids and Swedish Fish. Mm, it's my favorite. And I started indulging in that candy. And she came home one day and she said, where's all the candy? I said, I threw it out. And she said, how about a little self-control? And I said, oh, it took so much strength and self-control for me to throw those things away. That's exactly what I did. Hey, if I struggle with porn, what makes more sense? For me to continue walking into the jungle of the internet that's full of snipers and landmines? Or does it make more sense for me to just get rid of YouTube and just remove it and not have to deal with the ads and the pop-ups and the suggested videos that I'm gonna, not today, I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna look at it, I'm not gonna click on it. What if we just removed it and just got rid of it altogether? I know I'm not making friends today, but you know what, you need to hear it. What if you just got rid of it? If I struggle with friends who gossip, what makes more sense? I'm just not gonna engage in that part of the conversation. I'm just gonna teach them what's biblical, that gossip, maybe, or does it make more sense to just give a hard look at who's in your inner circle and make some tough decisions? Let's look at strength with wisdom and discernment. What if we measured strength in terms of awareness and not just brute force? God, take my blinders off. Help me be strong and help me to see the way that you see things. Help me be strong in my awareness, Lord. Paul said this in Romans, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. He said it again in verse 19. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Oh, if we would just have awareness. This is the apostle Paul that wrote half of the New Testament and was one of the main leaders of the early church. How much strength do you think it took for Paul to write an open letter to the world that says, I'm the model. I'm teaching you right from wrong. I don't wanna do evil, but guess what? I still do it. How much strength do you think it took for Paul to write that? I think it probably took a lot. How much strength do you think it takes to admit that we have blind spots? A lot. How much strength do you think it takes for me to admit that I need help a lot? How much strength do you think that it takes for me to implement guardrails, remove things and set boundaries when everyone else around me is not doing that and I gotta deal with persecution and questions as to why I'm not doing what they're doing? It takes a lot, it takes a lot. How much does God promise to those that are pure in heart? A lot. I'm gonna end on this, make this personal. I live a life with guardrails and boundaries. You would laugh if you saw how dumb my smartphone is. Make you laugh. You'd be surprised at the boundaries that I've had to set in some of my relationships. And you may be confused sitting here right now for why a pastor would need to live a life full of guardrails and boundaries. Well, that's because I've lived a life without them. I've been on the wide road and I've experienced destruction. I've seen what living life my way does and I've experienced the consequences that come with it. And you know what? It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And thank God that he opened my eyes. And you know what? He showed me that I got a lot to lose. And so do you. You got a lot to lose. I know that guardrails and boundaries can be inconvenient. 
But you know what? It may be one of the greatest rewards and gifts that will keep you on the road to reward. Let's pray. I never want to leave a service without giving people an opportunity to say yes to Jesus if they've never had an opportunity to do that or if you've fallen away and I want to give people an opportunity to do that now. Let me just tell you the simple gospel message. God designed us, he created us to live in perfect harmony with him. But because of sin and the fall of man in the garden, it created separation between us and God. So God in his loving kindness sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Fully man and fully God died a gruesome death. He paid the price that we were supposed to pay. It was meant for us. And now when I say that I believe in Jesus and what he did on the cross and I declare with my mouth that I put my trust and my faith in Jesus, I have a path back to the Father and I can live in perfect harmony and relationship with him once again. It's the greatest love story of all time. And so if you've never had an opportunity to do that or if you have fallen away and it's time for you to come home, I'm gonna come through this room in just a minute and I'm gonna ask you with every head bowed and every eye closed in this room, I just want you to raise your hand so that I can come in agreement with you and so that I can pray for you. I'm gonna start on the far left-hand side of this room. If you wanna accept Jesus into your heart today, please raise your hand now. Yes, sir, great decision. Jesus sees you today, amen. Anybody else on the left-hand side of this room? I'm gonna to come to the middle left-hand part of this room. If you wanna say yes to Jesus today, please raise your hand. Okay, good. I'm gonna to come to the middle right-hand part of this room. Anybody wanna give their life to Jesus today? Yes, sir, awesome decision. Anybody else? Good, I'm gonna to come to the far right-hand side of this room. Anybody here wanna give their life to Jesus today? Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Come on, anybody else? Amazing. If you gave your life to Jesus today, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for my sins. God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I need saving. I repent and turn from my ways. I declare today that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Fill me with the Holy Spirit now. And I pray for these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We give God some glory today for the people that were saved. Amen. Why don't we all stand? We got a lot to be grateful for. Let's worship like crazy this morning and praise the King of Kings.
we thank you. We want the fullness of all that you have for us in this life. We want your way. We declare your way is better than ours. Your way is better than the way of the world, the flesh, the devil. Your way is better than a mediocre Christianity, Lord. And we thank you for that powerful sermon this morning on the Sermon on the Mount. Walking that narrow way knowing that you see it in matters and you promise to reward those who seek you diligently. Father, help us to to live out these values. Let this value system become our value system, Lord. And let us shine brightly in a very dark world as we go. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you, and everybody said, can we thank him one more time this morning? Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us. Powerful morning. couple quick announcements. If you have an offering to give, you can put that in the white boxes in the back of the room. If you need prayer for anything or if you said yes to Jesus, please come on down. Get some prayer from this amazing prayer team. Have a great week.